I had a hot shower this morning and I didn't even think about what fuel warmed up the water. I also don't think much about where gasoline comes from when I fill up my truck at the pump. In this video, we're going back to here, where these fuels get pulled out of the ground. Have you ever seen one of these and wondered what it's actually doing? By the way, what do you call one of these? I've always called it a pump jack, but the other day someone was talking about a donkey, and it took me quite a while to figure out that this is what they were talking about. Let me know in the comments what you would call this thing. Maybe there's more names than just these two. Okay, the journey of oil starts a few thousand feet below this wellhead. Let's go down and take a look. We'll talk more about what happens near this wellhead in a minute, but first let's go down to the bottom of the hole. Now, putting this hole in the ground is a whole nother video about figuring out the geology and going through the drilling process. I haven't made a video about that yet, but subscribe to the channel and YouTube will let you know when it's done. Looks like we're pretty much at the bottom. Um, so now there's a few things I want you to notice. First of all, the hole leads us right to the middle of an oil deposit deep under the ground. In the side of this long pipe, there's holes in the casing that let the oil into the pipe. These holes exist only at the point where we want to collect the oil. When the well first gets drilled, there's often pressure built up in the oil field and the oil pushes to the surface all by itself. Now this typically gets released relatively quickly and then how does the oil get to the surface? We need an artificial lift system and it needs to be installed so that it can pull the liquid to the top. There's a few different artificial lift systems and they're usually powered by the donkey or pump jack that we saw at the surface. As the pump jack goes up and down, the lift system here at the bottom starts to push the oil to the surface. There's a few more things to discuss down here, but for now, let's follow the oil up to the surface. As we climb back up, let me note that although I've been calling it oil, there's usually a bunch of stuff that's mixed together in what we're pumping to the surface. It usually includes water, natural gas, maybe sulfur gas, and of course, it includes crude oil. Okay, now that we're back at the top, you'll see that the red end of this pump jack is moving up and down. You'll also notice that the red piece on the end is round, and a cable runs from the top of it all the way down to the wellhead. Each time the pump jack goes up and down, one cycle of the lift system completes and one cycle of oil is pulled out of the ground. The curved red piece is carefully engineered so the cable going into the wellhead is always vertical, perfectly lined up with the hole. As I keep talking, take a look and see how that cable stays perfectly up and down. Pretty cool. This whole pump jack system is designed to keep the power requirement at a bare minimum. The red end that we've been looking at is perfectly balanced across the fulcrum to ensure that all of the drive power goes into the pumping process. An electric motor turns a large flywheel to keep this whole pumping process going. If you listen carefully, you can hear the sound of the electric motor in the background. And you can also hear the wind blowing across my microphone. Now that oil is coming out of the ground, where does it go? This is what the pipes over there are all about. They take the whole mixture from the well and then they send it to a separator. This is what the inside of a separator looks like. The mixture usually comes in from the side and then the liquids go to the bottom of the tank and the gases go to the top. Often, there's some sediment that comes in that gets caught up in the flow and it settles along the bottom of the tank. The liquids separate further with the crude oil and water separating by density. And then each is drained out through a different pipe. Now at the top, the natural gas is separated out as well and it's sent to its own outlet. Pressure is regulated at each drain or outlet to ensure that levels and pressures are controlled inside the separator. If something unexpected happens and the pressure gets out of control, there's a pressure release valve that keeps the whole process safe. Each of the outlet pipes from the separator 
leads to a storage tank for each type of liquid or gas. In the end, you have a storage tank for crude oil and one for natural gas. And then from these two tanks, each product goes into the midstream system of tanker trucks and pipelines. The water and other byproducts are disposed of as part of the production process, and we'll talk about that next. There's an important reality that needs to be talked about that I glossed over when we were deep underground earlier. So let's go back there. The whole process we just went through is called primary recovery. And that's how almost all oil wells operated for a lot of years. Unfortunately, that process recovers less than 30% of the oil that's in the oil field. The reason the oil stops flowing is because there's not enough pressure in the oil deposit to move the oil into the well for pumping. Producers have figured out that if they inject water into the deposit a short distance away from the well, the pressure builds up again and then the oil starts flowing back into the pipe. This is called secondary recovery and will in some cases recover up to 60% of the oil in the oil field. Since this practice began, producers have expanded their injection methods to include many other types of liquids and gases. They are sometimes called tertiary recovery. This includes steam injections, CO2 injections, and a variety of chemical injections. With these additional methods, the recovery can reach up to 80% in some cases. That's recovering 80% of the oil that's in the oil field. Even with all these injections to keep the oil pressure up, the oil is still pulled up through the same well. In the same way that we walked through with primary recovery, the oil is lifted out of the well using the artificial lift system that's powered by the pump jack at the surface. And then from the wellhead, the oil mixture is processed through a separator to pull it apart into water, crude oil, natural gas, and other components. And then the crude oil and natural gas is collected into tanks waiting for shipment. And then many of the other components are pumped back into the ground for secondary or tertiary recovery. Now that we know how all that works, who makes sure that all of this is working? In a lot of cases, these wells are visited every few days by a technician, sometimes every day. They take note of anything that needs attention, and then they either fix it themselves or they call an expert. As field workers become harder and harder to recruit though, and operating metrics become more and more optimized, there's a need to connect all of these monitoring points at the site so that they can be viewed and analyzed remotely rather than sending people out all of the time. This is where Cisco Systems comes in. I work for Cisco and I love collecting data from the most difficult places on earth and then delivering it to operator screens and analytic systems, wherever they happen to be. For more information on this part and how that works, visit cisco.com slash go slash oil and gas. In summary, the next time you drive by one of these donkeys, you'll know that it's pulling oil from deep below the ground and deep below the road you're driving on, and then sending it on a long journey through tanks, separators, pumps, pipelines, and refineries to end up giving you a hot shower or filling the gas tank of your truck. Take care.